Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice. To get involved, go to xyadvisor.com or simply download the XY Advisor app. Accelerating innovation and globalization trends are disrupting global markets. We are a new generation asset management team that looks beyond traditional public markets to understand how innovation and disruption can benefit everyone. We are uniquely structured to solve the underweight to accelerating global innovation as we transition from Web 2.0 into Web 3.0. Our competitive advantage lies in the integration of our deep asset management and technology expertise under one aligned group to capitalize on the exponential opportunities of Web 3.0. The opportunities are for everyone. Invest different with Holon. Hello, my name's Andrew Rox, aka Roxy, and it is another pleasure to be here as the host of the XY podcast. Today I'm interviewing someone who uh, I know very well. Um, His name is Tim Farr and he's the Chief Operating Officer of Virtual Business Partners. Um, Strap yourself in. Um, There's very few businesses of this scale and he's going to be able to have some unique insights into what goes into making a successful scale business. With no further ado, uh, good morning, Tim. Good morning, Rox. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. That's all right. And um, it is your first time on, on the podcast. So, it, well, it is, but not the first time you and I have spoken by a long shot. No, it isn't. It isn't. And, <laughs> and, and uh, just as a, a, a letter of introduction, um, Tim and I share a couple of things. One is that we've both started as clients of Virtual Business Partners, and we're now both involved in Virtual Business Partners. But uh, Tim will be the star of today's show, no doubt. Now, Tim, before we get into that, before you were the Chief Operating Officer, um, you were a financial planner like many, many people listening here. And um, I always like to um, get a feel for how did you get there? You know, what, what was your, your story and what brought you into financial planning? Yeah, I guess we're all affected or influenced by our parents and what we see them do in their careers. Uh, in my case, I had a couple of generations of accountants um, in, in my background. And so, I, was, I generally led towards finance. I felt that I had a, a liking for commas and, 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 and numbers and, and those sorts of things, uh, which I did validate later in life. But I started out with an accounting degree and very quickly realized that that wasn't for me um, in the sense that a lot of the training for accountancy to start with, I know that's not the case later in the career and um, not whatever an accountant would do, is largely about the past. What have, what have you done? What's happened? Uh, and for me, uh, financial planning and the aspiration to pursue that as a direction was all about what can we do to improve the future rather than accounting for the past. And wh- whereabouts was that, Tim? Where, where are you from? Uh, so, Sydney born and bred. Um, uh, grew up in uh, the Hills area uh, uh, as a kid and that was a great place to, to, to grow up and, and uh, had a great environment to, to, to do that. Um, it, but my path was a little bit unusual in the sense that I didn't take the usual sort of career uh, trajectory. Uh, instead, I got married. I was very fortunate to find my soulmate early on in life and that sort of, as it does, it tends to style the, the sort of things you do. So, you know, I remember sitting down with uh, my, my uh, wife at the time and going, you know what, I could probably just be as happy as an architect or an engineer or a financial planner. So, I remember actually making an intentional decision to pursue that trajectory. Um, and back in the day, I actually, uh, I think I started out with, uh, it's called Integratech. They became Tribeca and then became what we know as Kaplan today. Um, and so, studying um, uh, the industry outside of the industry was really challenging doing that independently. So, just on that, you were, you were working as an accountant or you just finished your accounting quals no, and you decided com- just to j- jump into financial planning. What, what year was that, Tim? Completely different career. So, I think it was, um, it was, it was the year 2000, around, uh, 2000, 2001. So, um, that I sort of made that intentional decision. And I remember, you know, lining up for every job application as I was studying. I was looking for a different direction to take. Uh, I, in fact, I had a big thick file about 140 job applicants I was using through recruiting processes and just getting nowhere. So in, in back in those days, I actually looked up the FPA website. I found um, you know businesses in the area that I was uh, that was appropriate to work in, and I actually just went literally went door knocking and said, "Hey, look, I'm not ready now, but you might be ready, and I might be ready at some stage in the future." So um, I found that that really direct relational approach was was far more effective in uh, in um, you know striking creating those opportunities back back very early days. 
And so um, you completed Kaplan, what, what was it back then? Was it the diploma oh, of financial been, planning? Yeah, the diploma, which would, I think is now like the advanced diploma because it was eight modules. It was, it was the sort of the full thing. Um, and, uh, and so I started working in a practice. Um, and I literally was the guy who emptied the bins, made the coffees, uh, did the funds research that now we have 400 people do. Uh, <laughs> I, I was the guy that was ringing the cold list of clients that no one had spoken to for th- three or five years, um, you know, on behalf of the advisor. And then I worked my way up to associate and so forth. So, I, I sort of had that great experience of going in the ground level in financial services. And I think I look back at that. And, and as, as much as it was sort of a hard slog to get through, I think that's really given me a great understanding and appreciation of what the financial industries is at the ground level and also the things that we ask, ask our team members to do in supporting businesses. And, and knowing you now, it's also molded the fact that you're very keen on the best, highest use and, and probably very early on as much as emptying rubbish bins and calling and state, sitting on hold to uh, – to product providers was fun. It's probably not something you saw yourself doing for the rest of your life. No, but look, I look back at that time and I go, you know, ringing those clients and, and trying to get engagement was a great life experience to build resilience and also sales and, and relationship building um, because I knew that if I got through nine no's, I'd be just as grateful for the no because I knew I got a little bit closer to the yes, you know, someone who's happy to engage. So, And I think that's the approach I still take now 20 years later. I go, okay, well, I've got a no now, but I'm one step closer to getting the right outcome. It sounds like the, the sort of comment also that's made by a father. So, uh, you've got a couple of kids, Tim? <laughs> yes, I've got a 12-year-old, an 8-year-old, uh, and I think they teach you just as much as you, you learn in work. Um, and uh, so, it's great having them seeing going through that high school experience now um, as, as, as well. But there's this, some couple of uh, things, I suppose, you learn as being a father um, in the same way when you get married that tends to shift your priorities, so too does being a dad, and that they're good, all good things. Absolutely. So, um, after you've, you've, you've started, um, in your financial planning and you moved to associate advisor, which by the way is now an actual role, but then it was more <laughs> of a vibe. Um, uh, where, whereabouts was that and, and how long did you do that for? Yeah. So I was working with a, a, a an A&P line practice, um, in, uh, in Liverpool actually originally, because when we married, that's where we lo- lo- relocated at the time. Um, it was a practice that was close nearby. Um, and in fact, I remember being tasked with this thing called para planning that we have today when para planning didn't even exist. Well, back right? then it was for planners in Parramatta, to be brutally <laughs> honest. So, <laughs> so I remember sitting down with and sort of being tasked with, well, look, how do you make this role? How do you make it work? Um, what do you do when there was no guidance or technical support or even a thing called para planning? Um, and so that really was the requirement to move to an advisor back then um, and then build someone behind me to take over that what had been created in that capability. So I worked there for a number of years. Um, you know, long story short, there was a bit of a succession plan that didn't work out particularly <laughs> as everyone would have expected. That's very rare out there in <laughs> financial planning, Tim. Um, no, no one ever says that on the podcast. No, no. Um, but that was a great catalyst because I, you know, I remember speaking about being a father. We just had our first uh, child, uh, Chloe, and my daughter. And I went to my wife and said, look, hon, is it okay if you feel I step out on my own? <laughs> Perfect timing. Uh, and to her credit, she said, yeah, why not? Absolutely. This makes you happy and I can support you in doing that. And that's exactly what I did. So, at that point, um, I had an introduction. I was fortunate enough to go and sort of, uh, you know, build a capability alongside uh, another planner, uh, Michael Langtree, over towards uh, Hurstville at that time and then later Sutherland. Um, and uh, that was a great time as well uh, and, and learnt a lot of uh, things along the way. I think all of us, you know, Roxy and I have talked about this in, as well in various meetings. You know, if, if all of us reflect on our experiences to date and you asked, would you do it the same way? I think we'd say a resounding well, I think I haven't got a choice, have you? you say, yeah. <laughs> no. Essentially, you might learn from, from life's lessons. And I think that's the difference between wisdom and knowledge, really, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, uh, absolutely. If, if you're out there and you're listening to this and you're in your 20s, I would be latching on to someone uh, who's 65, who's got 40 years experience and absolutely. just asking about their wisdom. Absolutely. It's nuggets of gold, guys. But, but that's what styles, I suppose, our, our current conversations that Rox and I might have in, in, in various businesses that we're involved with because we go, look, how do we, how do we accelerate that growth rate? From those very early days, um, and uh, and how do we support businesses to uh, uh, approach it in a different way that gets scalable outcomes for, for everyone? And what kind of a financial planner do you think you were when you were giving advice? 
Oh, I thought I was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you mean. <laughs> but uh, maybe, it, maybe elaborate on that. Maybe, <laughs> maybe a bit more uh, around that, please. Yeah, sure. So I, I look I, when I looked at financial services, um, there was a couple of things. I, I saw that most businesses that wanted to be everyone to everything to everyone really struggled, particularly when they didn't have scale. So I, very early on, I, I, I at least uh, had concluded that I needed to focus. Uh, my attention on specific areas. So for that reason, I largely focused on corporate superannuation, um, working with, uh, you know, ASX listed businesses, et cetera, um, you know, to create, um, appropriate employment plans through, uh, through corporate superannuation. And look, whilst that was largely, that model's been largely abolished, in many respects, it was the greatest way for people to access affordable financial advice. That was funded through those group arrangements. Um, so I'd go in and I'd do basically speed dating <laughs> with 20 clients for a day, uh, you know, run the education seminars, which a number of people in the corporate space would do, uh, for a period of time. But the other thing I also, um, came to realize very on, early on is, um, and this maybe goes back to the accounting aspect and, and my passion for business, but I concluded that for, for, for business owners, the way to improve their financial position um, many of the strategies that are applicable for um, pay-as-you-go or personal financial planning just doesn't have the same degree of impact for those that are in business. Um, those who own businesses, the best way to improve their personal wealth was, in fact, to drive the performance of the business, which both increased the profitability and also the valuation uh, to them. So, for that reason, I went down a, a very unusual path. I think at the time, I was only one of six advisors in that particular network that were formally accredited for business advice, specifically across all of Australia. And then my focus largely became on business advisory, um, you know, running, uh, conducting um, valuations um, and uh, and working then in a sort of a chairman capacity to bring the right people into these businesses to help drive the, for, all for the goal of, of driving their personal um, outcomes. So after a period of time um, and, and sort of how I, uh, I did that for a number of years, I then realized that um, uh, that I should look and focus on the business aspect of it. I made a decisive decision to do a few things differently. And um, just before we, we, we move on to sort of your pivot, um, you mentioned about uh, the, the employee super and that education and that sort of gateway. Um, you, you're not the last person who, who's, um, who's mentioned that. In fact, a, a few guests in the last month have mentioned that. And uh, um, it kind of was an unintended consequence of, of regulation, but there, mm. there are now um, definitely companies that are in there filling that, that void. And in fact, one of the... The co-founders of XY, Ray, Ray Jarmus, he, he's he's uh, um, working with a company called Employment Hero, and it's just gone from from strength to strength. So there's a real demand mm. for that, and um, I, I think that that's um, something that that advisors will potentially get back into, although it might be in a different way because it's a advice on scale that potentially Australia needs. Absolutely, and back to that point of 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 you know, it, it's really about financial literacy. Uh, if I look at financial planning. Ultimately, it's about clarifying goals, but also you want to increase the literacy of the clients you're working with. So those sorts of schemes to provide it through um, employment um, relationships, I, I believe that the, the, the validity of those, those services is just as relevant as what it was 15 years ago um, today. Um, and businesses who are actively looking to engage their people and culture to drive team engagement should definitely be exploring means in which they can provide financial literacy programs as part of that experience um, through those different models and some of those avenues you mentioned. So you're there, you're, you're a frustrated business advisor, you've been a frustrated accountant, you're from a family of accountants, so you, you figure that you're the funniest one in the family, so you'll you maybe branch out into financial planning. I don't know how that ended up, I'm yet to, <laughs> I'm yet to be concluded, but... Um, and and you're building this system of advice. What, what 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 did you do next? So I had a sort of a, a sort of a, a significant moment, I suppose. So I found myself in a situation where you know a lot of people are probably listening to this have experienced it as well, where you sort of have a life sort of wakes you up and says, "Hey, look, you just need to reevaluate things." So I had a moment where I actually found myself having a a, a cardiac event, um, only in my thirties. Uh, and where I, I, I found myself, you know, sitting in a, a cardiac ward with a number of different 60 year olds who've, who've had major, um, uh, sort of issues. And, and it was purely just out of the way I was running things, the demands I put myself under, the pressures I had. And perhaps I hadn't got that balance right, um, between business and personal. Uh, and so at that moment, I made the decision that I need to make a key change. Um, so at that point, I then moved forward to sell, um, the financial planning 
aspect of what I was doing and really focus on the business consultancy and business advisor at that particular point. Um, now, what that had meant is um, I was, like Rox had mentioned, I was one of the early adopters of virtual business partner service, uh, services. That was largely because, you know, at the time, and we still talk about this issue of cost to serve, one of the greatest areas of expense is, is around labor efficiency for a business. So if you can leverage the economic arbitrage that's available through building global teams, um, then that is a really tangible way, if you get that right, um, to increase the profitability of the business. Um, so for me, that meant that um, that was my sort of introduction to virtual business partners and David Carney at the time. He came and spoke to a professional development um, conference. I liked what the style of person he was and, and what he had to say. Um, and I think I was in patient number eight in the zombie apocalypse where rocks you a little bit earlier than that. <laughs> and, and what did you have your um, so early days when you were looking effectively – to, to leverage your time and, and, and the way in which you speak about it now is very much a seasoned veteran looking, looking at the whole thing. What, what kind of tasks did you, did you get them to do? What did you not want to do again? Yeah. So I concluded that, um, being in business, uh, the challenge is, is if you're both an advisor and, and trying to operate a business, it really limits your ability to scale because the business is relying on you for revenue and that competes with, um, the, the various responsibilities you have in business itself and the ability to scale. So, you know, what, what I was looking to do is, is create a, uh, a, an environment where I no longer was the authorized representative. Um, I no longer was actually client facing, but instead focused on building teams um, of people who did that instead. Now, one of the interesting things that happened at the time, which really styled my decision to move out of FP, is my licensee actually wouldn't allow me to make that transition. So, in other words, for me to maintain my car and my AR, they demanded and insisted that I actually maintain my authorized rep status at that time, um, which actually hamstrung my ability to build a platform for advisors and to build the business at that point. So having signed a master services agreement 10 years earlier, um, having these sorts of caveats and restrictions that meant I was pursuing a, a path that was no longer aligned to the licensee, so uh, combined with the, the health issue I had at that particular time, sort of brought everything to a head and go, you know what, I know I've built all the systems to enable scale, um, but at this point, I'm not going to be able to go forward um, at this point. Oh, look, we normally get people to say a shout out to the the companies that they're talking about. We probably leave that one alone, Tim. Leave that one to an imagination. Oh, but, look, it's uh, not negative, but uh, you know, in these sense, um, there's great people in all those businesses. I look fondly back at all the relationships I had. Many of those people, unfortunately, have passed, uh, but who are pioneers in those businesses, despite their ne- negative public reputation. Um, you know, businesses are made up of people, and there's some really good people that I'd attribute my learnings and experiences along the way. It was just the set of rules that they had at the time and the playbook they had. And what I, what I was, I was hoping to do now is just change gears and look, a, a big excitement for the reason that I wanted to, to talk to you today is just the unusual position you've found yourself, um, running, uh, what possibly is the largest by headcount financial services business in Australia and, and just getting some key observations. Um, so, uh, you know, the business that you're in that I'm very familiar with maybe gives a bit of a feel for what it is. Yep. Um, and, and from a financial planning perspective, and, and you're kind of like the keeper of all secrets. You, you, you're across all licensees. You're across all tech. Um, so maybe once you've done that, I'd really like to pick your brains. And, and we may even get to a stage where I, I ask, I, I hit you up and say, who does it best? What piece Ooh, of tech? You know, okay, like, right. I'm, I'm giving you a few minutes to, to, to percolate on that. So, um, so maybe give, you, give us a bit of a platform of what you're doing now. Yep. And then I'll, I'll, I'd like to ask some questions about your observations. Yeah, great. So the, how I made the transition from, you know, making a, a, an unfortunate, what I felt was a really unfortunate decision to exit because there was no other option at this stage. I couldn't transfer licensee because of their view of who owned clients, et cetera. Um, you know, I just pursued the, the business consulting. At that point, you know, virtual business partners had uh, had some dealings with me. They knew of who I was. Um, and they had asked me to come and drive um, building power planning capability within the business uh, initially as a consultant um, and to and specifically. So I went into that business with the express intention of scaling and creating a scalable advice delivery um, business in power planning. When I looked around at the uh, the market at the time, the models that were typically used around pay per use and 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 licensee specialization. I couldn't find any examples where that actually scale on, 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 on any significant level. Um, so, you know, the, the, the nut I really wanted to crack is like, how do we serve and provide exceptional advice? Um, as we look at, um, uh, financial planning, 
a lot of the constraint, even though we're losing financial planners at a fairly r- alarming rate, um, the main uh, sort of uh, sticking point for for much advice production is the generation of the documents themselves. So, you know, even in the power planning function, that as a resource uh, is quite limited to ob- obtain the right skill sets and an appropriate cost that makes that appropriate. Um, now, in the role that I have, we don't ever seek to replace Power planners that sit in businesses. In fact, you know, we're very much looking to create a career um, uh, platform for them to move into more leadership of the teams we put in place rather than replacement of. Um, and as Roxy would attest, you know, I've heard you say before, spending EBIT becomes pretty addictive, right? So, <laughs> so if we're driving that for businesses, then they're only going to invest more in Australian resources and teams as we've, we've done ourselves. And I might touch on that a little bit later. Um, around that. So I came into Virtual Business Partners and uh, I was really thrilled that through the team, of course, it's not my own individual efforts, um, we were able to go from zero to 100 power planners in the space of 12 months. Wow. And, and was, it, was there any particular AFSL that you worked with or – or, or, or maybe give us an idea of the early days. Yeah, so the early days were pretty like hands on. Uh, uh, you know, it included me sitting alongside power planners, uh, looking at their strategies and, and the documents they were given. Um, and to their credit, um, you know, you, you hire the right people, you, you train them, and provide the right tools and support. It's incredible what people can provide. And particularly in this case, where we create a large core group, you bring any new person into that environment. The speed of learning and the culture that's created is just it's just electric, absolutely electric. So in the early days, um, the the business that in virtual business partners was largely AMP focused as a, a legacy of of where business activity had started, um, and also as as anyone in the industry would know, you know AMP's usually been slapped around with enforceable undertakings and the like, which means they've had to get very very clear and explicit about their policy. Now I'm not going to go into what opinions people might have around those policies, but what it means is 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 AMP had to be very concise about the standards and the advice standards. And we knew if we built them to those requirements, we could satisfy a number of licensees. Um, bearing in mind that one of the, the key goals for the power planning function was to create a licensee agnostic offering. And, and again, part of that scalable issue was there might have been an RI advice power planning capability. There might have been, you know, some other licensee. But how do you actually create a genuinely agnostic capability and, and the answer to that was really around, well, they're all playing by the same rule book, but it's just their interpretation of those policies will differ. So as long as we, you know, typically you think about, you know, if you do all things to all people, you become the master of none, right? But our master tr- mastery was around how do we be masters at understanding those variables, creating that one source of truth between us and clients and licensees, and then focus all the training, development, quality assurance around that um, very early, which meant we were able to serve, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, 15, 20 different licensees, you know, much more now these days, um, because for those reasons. And where is where is the business at today, Tim? The power planning business. Yeah, so the advice business. It's been great to see that grow to around two hundred. Um, I'm no longer sitting next to power planners. Uh, helping them with the strategies. We've got my far more capable people who, who do that every day, uh, which is awesome to see. And, and I get so much excitement from seeing people who didn't even know what power planning was, like I was 20 years ago, um, be able to perform at, at exceptional level uh, very quickly and do things that uh, many external parties or, or viewers would, would, wouldn't think is possible at all. I'm just going to reverse a bit because um, even – when my personal business was at its largest, we had about 40 odd, odd, odd team members. The numbers you're throwing around are, are, are quite large. And, and given we've had two years of COVID and, and you've, you've, it's very unlikely you've been in the same room as, as, as many, if not all of these yeah. people. Um, how do you, how do you manage, um, how do you manage that scale of, 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 of operation? Um, this is coming from a bloke who had a cardiac event 15 years ago and we, we don't intend on that happening again. No. So what have you put in place to do that and how do you – I mean, just things like the, the education, the, 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 you know, the main thing I wanted to ask about was how do you run a business at scale without dropping debt? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I was fortunate the virtual business partners had a good, a great platform in terms of, you know, hiring and recruitment and those things. And, and, and so as a business within a business, I suppose, um, you know, that business now is 850 people. We'll grow at another 300 people this year. Um, uh, and that is quite comfortable. Um, so <laughs> in the sense that we, we, we want to make sure that advice delivery standards don't drop. And we're quite confident we'd be able to do that. Um, in terms of what makes the difference. Um, well, I think, you know, when I looked back at those experiences, 
it was largely based on pressures and stress that I placed on myself. I had actually nothing health, uh, actually physically wrong with me. It was purely my state, my ability to balance load, um, and also realize that a lot of the deadlines I placed or had in my mind were often ones that were self-imposed. So in a lot of cases, I just had to let them go, um, be better at prioritizing. But in terms of how we make that work, there's a couple of pieces or pillars that are absolutely vital. Um, the first one is the right cadence. So, you know, any every business struggles with this, whether you're 40, as you mentioned, rocks, even 5, 12, um, and that just gets compounded on those sorts of numbers that we're talking about. So you really have to double down on, on cadence of, of communication. Um, you know, just, just to be specific, what do you mean by that? Yeah, so these are very, very clear meeting rhythms um, in in the business. Um, so as a as a and there's two elements to cadence, um, and and one of those is operational cadence. So what's happening in the business? What decisions need to be made? How do you get a decision maker? And how do you get information up and down the 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 sort of the organisational chart, if you like, very quickly? So one of the practices that has always has, has been an absolute pillar. Is, is the routine of daily huddle. Uh, in our business, we have that at every level of our organization so that issues from the frontline teams get all the way to executive level if needed, but the intent is to solve them at each level along the way. That's operational cadence. Um, more recently, we've been really focused on performance cadence. So, okay, that's what's not working, what's needed, what's broken, what needs to be fixed, um, but also operation. Uh, the, the performance cadence is all about who needs help? Are people meeting the goals? And in an organization that size, you need to be very clear as to what the goals are. They could be company goals or in our case, it's the client goals. So we know if we align our team members' goals to our client goals, then that'll ultimately provide uh, you know, the business what it wants. So I've always been very much um, grounded in values-based advice uh, and I believe that principle re- is, is applicable in any degree of scale. So in other words, if we can drive meaningful value for our clients first, and that's our focus. We know what we'll get out of it along the way if we do a good job, a reasonable job of it. So that, they would be the two of the, the key pillars. The last one is that goal setting. Um, so you know, and 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 the business outcome goals are really easy. So as an advisor, you might have you know four appointments a week, two fact finds, a three plans, but but they're all outcomes. What I'm talking about specifically, which is a lot harder to define, is those development goals. What is it the person needs in order to hit? the outcomes that are, that are important for the business. Um, and that's a skill set that most leaders don't have. Um, and I'm sure many people would attest that even though they might be in leadership roles themselves, and I sat in a room with you know some very senior executives across a number of industries uh, just recently, there was no really formal pathway to becoming a leader. So, you know, how can we create um, – uh, so what that creates is one problem. People aren't great at actually focusing on development goals. Um, and secondly, how can we actually d- deliver a program that creates leaders and builds people to become the very p- best possible versions of themselves? And, and given that predominantly the uh, financial planning industry, the mortgage breaking industry, is is a small to medium sized uh, business, um, what do you see? And here I'm getting into the, the picking of your brain. And um, what do you see people doing really well at, at at that level? And what do you see just common? Common things that they do poorly that you just pull your hair out because it's so easily fixed. Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of what is happening in the industry is is, is governed by regulation, um, and this is a topic that's been talked about for a very long time. But you know, I feel that my position on regulation is regulation is is only helpful if it actually helps people get access to financial advice. So that really should be the litmus test as to whether re- regulation has, has been successful or not. And I, I generally feel that as an industry, and that's evident by the number of changes of, of ownership and, and direction, um, as to, um, as to, um, we haven't quite got that right yet. Um, but I feel that if we just applied that brush uh, and that test to those regulations, we'd probably end up at a point that actually achieves the right outcomes and makes financial advice more uh, accessible um, to, to more Australians in some of the ways we talked about similarly. So that would be the first point. And what about the things that you see, you observe in, in, in day-to-day practices that you just you, you just wish you could have a time machine and take people back 10 years and fix it? Yeah, well, I guess you know, what's great about what we do as a fairly broad church is we get to solve problems for a range of different sessions, situations, remediation, look back, um, you know, some fairly uh, challenging situations. But having solved that for one business and driving driving that as a project means we can take that to other 
other businesses and say, hey, you know what? You're not alone. You know, that's the hardest thing. I think you go, look, I'm struggling with this. I go, you know what? You're, you're not the only one. You're not the first problem. You're not the la- last person who'll struggle with these things. But those who are, who are doing really well, um, they focus on building their people rather than being very good practitioners themselves. So I think as soon as you make that mental shift in business ownership to go, look, I'm going to create an environment for people to deliver advice, um, then that's a, a, that affects every other aspect of a decision making you make. So those who are doing well invest in their people. They realize that, that they are really the engine to getting the right outcomes um, and, and make sure that the client experience is, 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 is very, very clear. And typically, what, what kind of scale are those businesses, Tim? Are they... They one hundred person businesses. Uh, do they do they wait till ten, or where do you see that that kicks in? Yeah, so I think that, that attitude can start from a very early point. Um, but I think the, the you run out of money, Tim. You do. Yeah, you're either you know it's money, time, or people, right? Um, so I think that 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 can happen. That happens soon as you get a practice manager or someone who's actually focused on something that's not operations itself. And let, let's 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 define what your interpretation of practice manager is or or general manager Um, because, uh, you know, from our previous discussions, you're very firm on this. This is the the turning point in a business going from being a business that that works you to a business that that, that you you sort of um, you own and manage. So what do you define as a practice manager and what roles do they have and and, and what, what part do they play in a progressive scaling up financial planning business? Yeah, excellent. Great question, Roxy. So I think all of us would easily agree to the concepts of a front office. It's your front of house that's seeing clients, uh, that's engaging in, in, in uh, advice delivery, um, and also back office, which we've touched on before. It's your administration support. It's your power planning function. But the key role we're talking or key capability we're talking about is, in fact, a, a middle office. So in that middle office is really uh, themes of the right technology stack. Uh, it's going to have around um, what's our employee experience? What's our team engagement? Do we have people who are actually motivated to grow within the business and grow the business as a result of that? Um, it's a- around issues of systems and workflows. So how do we create operational excellence in that business? Um, and the, 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 the challenge, though, for those practice managers is often they would look around the business and go, you know what, everyone's got a job. I can't drive these 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 improvement projects because I just don't have the resources internally, and that's where some of the solutions we, that we have uh, in virtual business partners might be relevant to solve that. Um, but uh, in in solving that challenge, but yeah, it's really that middle office function that's focused on people, technology, culture um, in in driving businesses, rather than you know what we'd often see is client service managers who are just given the title of practice manager, but haven't been actually set up for success. In that role, well, I think that's that's really important because um, you're right. Uh, you know, it's every other business that's out there, including almost all of our businesses that our successful clients ha- have. The most important people in the business are the general managers, mm. the connectors, logistics, the people managers, and um, in financial services, quite often, as you say, it is the role of the the, the head of the operations team or the head of the admin team um, to step into that. Um, but I just see a, a real failing in all of um, all of the education streams, all of the development streams in our industry. And just what I mean by that, there's plenty of CPD points for advisors. There's plenty yeah. of power planners. You know, life insurance companies will run great courses for people in the back office and operations. But there's just that that kind of general manager who effectively is running the business of the business. There seems to be a, a void there. Um, and yet you've just rated it as the most important um, person in the business. So, where do you see the industry fixing this? Yeah, 100%. So, I think at, a, at an early stage, you're going to have a, a capacity wall. So, you're going to run into, I just don't have enough capacity to deliver. Um, but the other, the next sort of challenge or, 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 or um, barrier to break is one around complexity. Um, and so, that complexity, so the way people tend to solve this rock stancy question more specifically is we're seeing a great deal of mergers and acquisitions across our industry of people that rise at that middle tier or, 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 of, of, of advice business as a means to solve that or to gain access to talent um, in, in, in this middle office, office capability. And, and is- is that being led by licensees? Is it being led by private equity? Is it just being led by the realisation that 
that, that profit can only come through scale? Or what, what do you see is, is leading that, that consolidation? I think it's all of those things. Um, but, the, it, but to be more specific, um, we've got licensees withdrawing from their, t- their traditional business models. Um, and also moving, which I think in, in many cases is great for the industry, is to be capital enablers, enablers through the provision of equity, um, to allow you know those who are good operators across their network to to achieve that, uh, that 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 consolidation. So I think that's definitely one part of it. The second part of it is I don't think you know you and I, if we went back to the back, you know, we tried to start again as a single advisor, be incredibly challenging compared to what it was 15, 20 years ago. Um, you know, so I think that secondly is part of it. It's just the complexity of it. And then thirdly, I go, maybe you can start, but can you scale profitably? And as you said, stay sane along the way. And I, I'm, I'm not sure the answer to that is a resounding uh, yes. <laughs> I'm not sure financial planners start sane based on my, my, my friends in the industry. But, um, no, you're correct. And, and you mentioned before um, things you touched on tech stack, employee experience, workflows, operational excellence. Um, given that you're across um, literally hundreds of practices, um, uh, now's your chance. What, what what do you see? And you don't have to name the names because I know that you were involved in every one. But what what's, what do you see when a tech stack works? And what do you see are the common problems when people put together a tech stack? And feel free to shout out or not. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess we're fortunate to have worked for the licensee as well of the practice. So we have been the delivery engine um, in, in licensees. And it's up some of the facts, some of the mid-tier licensees, we are the licensee in terms of the services we provide. Um, so I think the, the, in terms of tech stack, I think the common pitfall that most people run into is they look for the technology to solve the problem. But often the technology stack is often a black box. It's, a, it's something that has to be crafted around your workflows. So instead, you know, let's start at the right place uh, and go, look, what is it we're trying to achieve? Um, and, and, and specifically, there's three problem statements that are very clear across the industry. I mean, you know, there's, there's lots of problems if you read <laughs> much of the publications and, and hence why I'm so aligned to the XY advisor uh, value proposition, which is all about positive change of advice. Um, I completely agree with that. We need to be talking more about it. There needs to be more noise about its opportunity. Um, so when we come to the, the three problem statements, um, the first one is about sales cycle. So how long does it take to engage a client through to actually providing advice? Um, and in many cases, when we, when we did some research around this, um, the larger businesses, their sales cycle increased. So oh, sorry? larger businesses increase the, the amount of time it delivers advice compared to smaller advice businesses. So that was a really interesting insight, which led us to, um, you know, fully understand that that's that complexity wall. Um, and that's to do with the fact you've got more people involved in the file. So if, if you are a, a, a follower of, of lean principles, um, lean, it doesn't take 30 days to produce a piece of financial advice, as the sales cycle would suggest. It's not 30 days of effort. It's 30 days of time. So where do you target the, the, the periods of time where that file is idle? It's, it's about getting waste. And so for financial advice, the wastage is idle time when it's sitting, sitting idle, not doing anything. And it's also how effective is the handoff handover between each of those roles? Does the next person in the, in the operational chain have everything they need to do to move confidently forwards? So that's the first one. Second one is around client experience. And it's related, it's obviously related to the sales cycle um, piece because if, 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 when we're experiencing very challenging global markets, um, clients would often, that would be a catalyst to reach out for advice. And they go, oh, Mr. Advisor, I need to get, I need to understand what do I do? Um, and many advisors have to turn around and say, look, it's going to be 30 days, 60 days before I can actually get back to you with a formal position and we can execute. That doesn't create a great client experience. It's not con- uh, congruent with with what they would hope to achieve. When, when the sky is falling, it generally doesn't fall progressively over 60 days in a linear fashion. No, that's right. And look, if, if, and if an advisor is anything worth their salt, they would have explained to the client, when you feel like throwing a brick through a window, make sure there's a check attached because that's exactly the point you should be buying it. So if you've done the education piece, that should be less of a problem. But in any case, they will want a, a timely course correct. So that second one is really around that client experience. How do we improve it? Sales cycle is a big component of it, but also coming back to your point about technology, how does technology actually support that client experience? What are the touch points the clients are making with your business? When we we were we kicked off a systems a program internally last year, and how we prioritize the things we do is we just we mapped out the client journey and we went right. We're going to start with any point a client touches our business.
business, that's the part we're going to work on first and look to potentially technology to make that experience more scalable uh, and, and improve it where possible. So that was the second one. Third one was around um, the, the uh, rework. Um, most advisors would think rework is I get a plan back, I need to change that document. Um, that's not rework for us. Our definition of rework is really around how, how does that next person in the advice chain have to come back to clarify things they've received throughout the, the file. Um, and the other thing is um, uh, is how complete is that information around it. So three problem statements to recap. First is sales cycle. How do you solve it? Obviously, if you reduce the sales cycle, you improve the cash flow of the business. Um, secondly, you'll also improve the client experience and how do you target that specifically. And then thirdly, it's around we work, rework. You know, how do you create a really effective handoff, handover? Um, and I think, you know, that's that's something you wrestle with as you scale. So, how do you remove complexity how, and how do you leverage technology that actually supports it? Now, that all sounds really, really good. But yet, yet again, we're, we're sitting here um, in one room and, and all of the people who work for you are, are all around the world. Um, how do you how do you know that they're doing the things that, that you want them to do? Like, how, what's the oversight? Yep. So, the first part is is definitely that cadence. So, that's you've got to know what's happening. But the second part is what data do you have to support it? So, you know, for me, uh, I really much leverage and lean on data for any decision making. It's probably part of my bias as as as, as some of the occupations. A frustrated engineer. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, we use things like a time camp as one specific example. There's lots of other technologies around there, but it does autonomous tracking of of what users are, uh, are working with um, and also a structured tracking around projects. So, a project in the context of financial planning practice might be the client file or the piece of business you're working on. Um, but we use those insights in a whole range of different ways. So, for example, for our for our teams, we can see what the mix is between different technology um, across their tech stack. So, as an example of that, if we're seeing a power planner and they're spending like a day a week in email, well, they're not having a client-facing role. So, why are, they, why are they in the email? So, that will tend to tell us that the, the, uh, the individual doesn't have a task management system. They're having to spend a lot of time doing rework clarification, most likely via email. And that sort of allows us to troubleshoot. Now, the really cool thing that can happen is if we've got a, you know, in many cases, our team members might be 30% of the headcount for a business you know, in a partially optimized business. So, it's very likely that what the team is experiencing that we have data around is also the experience for the rest of the Australian team. It's the iceberg, isn't it? Right? Yeah. Absolutely. So, you know, that data and those insights are incredibly useful to understand, you know, is the tax tech, tech stack that the business has got, is it effective? Does the as the, the role themselves been set up for success? And it's very likely that the data we're able to provide is, is a good insight into what's happening across the broader business as well. So, we have discussions around those topics um, fairly regularly. And so, you surely have, 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 have managed to dodge which particular piece of technology you feel works best. Well, it's, it's a bit like um, I, I get asked that question quite a lot. You know, is it X plan? <laughs> is it Salesforce? And I, and I go, look, largely, I, I think there's some really interesting emerging technologies, which I'd be very, very um, keen in supporting. But I think, you know, largely um, at the risk of probably offending everyone, it's a, it, it can be a bit like what's the best bank? I go, well, they're all banks, aren't they? Um, so, if, if for me as an advisor, even if I look back at my early experience, if I had logged into X plan as a, as a pr- principal, it was a bad day. Right, doesn't matter if X plan or, or, or whatever technology, but at any point, I'm now then on the tools is not the highest and best use of my time. So, if, if, if you're still having advisors who are doing model portfolios or fund comparisons or research or delving into X plan for anything else that's not file notes, where their highest best use is seeing clients, solving problems, securing revenue, well, then there's an opportunity to optimize your business and consider whether building a global team is an appropriate means to achieve it. And um, I, I kind of know the answer to this question, but I, I want to ask it because it's, um, <laughs> it's hilarious. Um, Given that time camp, um, as you, you've mentioned, can actually show us how many seconds tasks take, um, there is an internal uh, capability for that. But one of the fun things is it actually highlights which companies put our people on hold the longest. Yeah, that's right. So, so-, <laughs> so we're supposed to, these are companies quite often that we're giving investment dollars to or insurance dollars to. And, 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 and in relation to that, is there anything, and this is a great forum and you could end up being a hero out of this, is, is there anything, any advice you could give to the product providers who, who are providing the, the platforms, the funds, the insurances, et cetera, 
on how they engage with with their advice practices because um, uh, and, and just how wildly different the experiences can be. So maybe touch on that, please. Yeah, absolutely. So look, Time Camp is just one example. There's lots of other productivity tools. Um, some of the other data that's really useful is team engagement um, and, th- and uh, there's a whole range of pieces around that if you wanted to explore on that today. But when it comes to the approach the providers are taking, I think we have to go back to and say, look, what is, how do we solve the problems for the customer? How do we get more people access to high-quality advice that achieves the right outcome? You know, what can they do better? And specifically in those areas we've spoken about. So, in what way a provider can help with sales cycle? Well, if, if, if we're seeing a trend where they're, they're, they're consuming so much time on the phone to get uh, data and insights for part of the advice process, well, there's one meaningful, tangible way that providers can work towards um, in, in having a meaningful impact on that, uh, the, the productivity of a particular practice. Um, what, can, what investment can those providers make into some of those areas I've spoken about? Um, can they lean in with technology? Uh, can they lean in with um, a training and development um, as well? Or, you know, make sure we've got the right mix of support. Um, you know, as we've seen margins squeezed on licensees and product providers, a lot of the great people that would often be in interacting with your business to talk about these things, even just to be a sounding board, have actually been removed. You know, your PDMs, your BDMs and those sorts of things. So how is it that these providers who do have the benefit of scale, um, you know, work alongside these businesses um, in some of these areas. And it's just frustrating that that um, companies that, that are, uh, you know, open for business and wanting the financial planning industry to support them still are running a, a half an hour average wait time to be spoken to. Yeah. It's um, it, it's a real paradox. Yeah, and it's just data. So there's got to be better ways to, to, to gain access to it. So I think, you know, let's agree on a common set of problem statements and, and it'd be great for the participants in the industry to, to, to focus on them specifically and then turn to very pragmatic solutions for things that are within our control because there's no point shouting at the wind about regulations, um, expecting change. Uh, whilst that's important to, to be proactive and lobby, the reality is that any one individual business is not going to be able to make some significant change. So to your point earlier, you asked questions about who are being successful. I can tell you unequivocally that those see the current environment, market environments as an opportunity rather than a threat are the ones that will come out the winners. And... Um Let's just talk more about the business of, 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 of the scale of the business as far as um, so many people. When we're talking about people and culture, what tools do you recommend or what tools are you, are you using to, to help run that that are actually working? Because there's a lot of ones out there that say they can do things um, and, and there's people out there who will pay their SaaS contracts and whatnot, but uh, have you got some firm opinions around what, what does work? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we um, implement in our business a particular technology called CultureAmp. Um, uh, there's a number of different solutions available, but the, the key point is having a technology that's actually all about gaining insights about how your people um, are, are feeling, the general health of the business. Uh, the second part is a, a structured means to do performance reviews, um, and, and there's just as much ambiguity about what a performance review is um, just as there is around, you know, the position descriptions of practice managers and power plans, like what's the scope of those roles? So, you know, clear scope, clear goals, clear performance st- structure. And, and, and even in our recent times, we had to circle back and go, you know what, what we'd set up originally or previously, it wasn't really focused on the human as an individual. So we moved, we intentionally moved away things that included scores or quantitative metrics and really focused and doubled down on goals. So, you know, do you have a platform that provides cascading goals that provides that line of sight? So the thing I do as a power planner or a financial planner or, or a uh, financial planning assistant, I know directly in what way that moves the result for the client and I know it removes the result for the business. Everyone wants to know they're in a job for purpose, right? So if you can provide that line of sight, um, you know, uh, around those sorts of issues, then technology such as CultureAmp is, is, provides some really useful tools. But again, it's how you use it. What's the purpose of it? Um, just buying another piece of technology and expecting to solve your people problem. Is, is not it. You've got to have a, a genuine buy-in and commitment from everyone to, to um, uh, but use these as meaningful insights for data and direction as to where to focus first. And I think you, I think you nailed it there. People need a purpose. 
Um, you know, there's a lot of a lot of conversation around. It. It's a tight labour market in financial advice. It's hard to get people um, working for you. Um, we've got the rate great net resignation either happening or about to happen. Um, and and I totally agree. I think that the people who work for you, regardless of what role they have, all want to know what their effort for that day has done and how it's helped the client and how they've derived utility from it. So so making that connection is critical. Yeah, particularly for A players. So if you're looking to have A players in your business, they will want to know how they're performing. They will want to have structure around what they should be doing and whether they're hitting the mark. Um, so if you've got those people in your business, you're just going to frustrate them by without having that structure and purpose in place and you'll lose them to someone else who has prepared to invest in those areas. Yeah, correct. So um, right now... Uh What's today hold? I'm, I'm very interested to know what, where are you at at the present day? How do you run your day? And and, and um, where do you see the future of financial advice practices? And mm. I want you to be quite detailed okay. here because Big question. you're across a few of them. Um, so yeah, what, how do you how do you operate your current day? And where do you see the future of practices? Yep. So my current present focus is really supporting the team. My version of leadership is one of where I'm there to serve. So whilst I might have a, a, an executive title, an executive role, and, and obviously the decision-making that comes with that, um, my function, my highest and best use is saying, how do I enable my team and my people to really be successful in what they're doing? Um, and so that's largely part of my focus. In terms of my rhythms, uh, it would consist of having that cadence of the morning, um, you know, having that opportunity where issues from the, from the frontline teams, um, would, uh, cascade up to, um, it, to, to decision making if needed. And that information gets back down as quickly as, and, as possible. And how, how many levels are we talking here, Tim? Uh, probably about four. So there'd be at least four, if not five levels of, of leadership to um to uh, communicate through now there's a lot more we can do better and we focus on that every day so i just want to give a you know use this opportunity to give a couple of shout outs to some of our team members uh we've got some incredible people um across in the philippines as our, our senior leadership team who, who drive that business who have overcome incredible adversity and tested our bcp to its fullest extent in recent times with the combination of covid and the typhoon uh, and also shout out to our incredible australian leadership team which has expanded recently across role of, of uh, relationship management, um, quality assurance, and client services support. So we can actually, you know, put people and drop people into business improvement projects along our clients, our practices that we work with, uh, or the corporate um, clients that we have um, who can make incredible tangible means leveraging their 10, 15 years experience at the, at the, the cold face of, of business improvement with those, those clients. And um, with all of that in place, the only missing piece for going forward is is your your definition of a perfect client. Now I know that there that that's that's uh, sort of might be a bit of a stretch, but what what traits do you see of the people that are, are coming in to engage across multiple parts of of your business that um, uh, that are leading indicators of future success? Yes, yeah, so I, th- I think um, for us for us it's really about do we have alignment? So does the business generally have the same values that I've expressed today in terms of their people, uh, in terms of solving problems, being prepared to invest in those problems. And also there's a degree of vulnerability I think that's in needed in any um, genuine partnership where you go, you know what, we haven't got this right and both parties need to be able to say that at the time as you wrestle with these different challenges. Um, and then a, a very clear open commitment to rally around them in different ways. Um, you know, people, uh, the, 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 the business of people is messy and everyone's in the pe- business of people. So, um, uh, and I, I mean. Love, I love that comment <laughs> because sometimes I think we like to over plan things, but Mike Tyson used to say, and oh, I'll probably get this wrong, but everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. And I feel like that's how financial planners work. They get up in the morning. They get going and then there's an email or a phone call and they've just been punched in the face. Yeah, and that, that's a great way of describing if you If you follow um, uh, Covey uh, at all, he would talk about the whirlwind versus the strategic or your wildly important goals. Um, and I think, you know, a business has to be intentional about pursuing strategic improvement um, and, and, and deliberately putting aside the whirlwind distractions um, for both themselves as, as senior leaders in the business, but also creating that same structure and rigor for their teams as well. So, you know, our ideal client, uh, someone who's, who's going to benefit from this the most is where you've, you've got that 
some degree of middle office in place. You've got some degree of practice management or general management in a, in a practice business um, specifically. Um, you you have realized there is both a capacity and a complexity challenge in the business. You've probably leveraged or tried a number of different avenues. Maybe you spent a fortune on technology at some point only just to realize, you know what, it's just a box Right. So for us, we're, we're not, uh, we're very much people plus technology will get the right results. Um, so how do we help support that people strategy or define, help you define that people strategy? Um, and then how do we leverage best practice workflows? Because bear in mind, BBP as a business has been in global teams for eight years. We did, never had the luxury of being in an office together. So as the world has had to come to grips with how do you do this remote work <laughs> thing, like that's what we've had to lead with and 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 craft um, over a number of years as we built these this capability for for the clients um, across power planning and, and the financial planning uh, administration services and and mortgage brokering as well. And where do you see the financial advice um, landscape moving in the next couple of years? I think we've had the. Uh, uh, the difficult times, but yeah, I'd be very interested. Where do you see it in five years and where do you see your, your personal involvement in it? So I think the core values of financial planning is really around that topic for literacy. Like how do we provide meaningful financial liter- literacy? Um, well, can't they just go on, on, on YouTube or TikTok? Or, yeah, of course. You know, or, maybe or, or, a, a, a <laughs> flip, what they call it, a fin, fin or influencer. Fin influencers, which, which potentially have their place, but that you need a combination, don't you? Yeah, you absolutely. It. It's yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you know, it's about scalable advice. So if I look at, say, you know, even like the XY model, um, you know, it's all about creating the right community, the right forums for connection to occur, even if not in a physical sense. So you know, how do we create that experience for our for potential clients, uh, the market? Um, the other element of it is very much around. You know, I think largely we've failed in the public eye to create a profession rather than an industry. So I shared an example of accountancy uh, uh, previously. You know that's very much seen rightly or wrongly as being a profession, one of of particular standing. Why, and, why do you think? So why forth. do you think we failed? Uh, well, I think two parts. I think regu- regulation without those in, that that intent I mentioned before that litmus test. I think we've created leg- legislation that's hindered the ability to reach uh, the r- right number of people. Um, and I think secondly. Uh, we as an industry have not been incredibly consistent or clear as to the value of our advice. Um, I would, I'm sure many advisors, if they spoke to their clients, would go, I'm not, I wasn't really sure why I came to the door. I knew I needed help, but now I'm here. I just can't believe that I haven't spoken to you sooner. Um, the value you create for us, the security, um, the clarity is, is just incredible. So how do we create that again on scale without needing a face to face meeting? with 45 minutes to build rapport and articulate that value proposition. So, you know, businesses in their own right need to wrestle with that particular challenge. But as an industry, how do we create that really positive um, articulation of the value that our clients often receive after engagement, but well before that? I think unless we do that, we're not going to see people lining up for financial planning courses. We're not going to see people pursue or, 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 or be able to articulate and be proud of the fact they're in financial services. I'm incredibly proud of, it, of, our, of our industry and the profession I've had. I know and I'm confident about the value that I've delivered to clients over those years. Um, and I'm very confident in, the, in knowing that our clients deliver that same value to, to our clients. But how do we create that in the minds of the industry? Um, and, and in many respects, there's very few professions that get built around at a parliamentary level. There's probably maybe only two or three that, that have had that sort of interaction. So how did we get there? Um, how do we take the right ownership? How do we have those right conversations? Um, and how do we create that education uh, as to the market of what we do um, and also the decision makers? Because in many cases, if we're not making the decisions for the right reasons, we're not going to get the right outcome. So can we have a clear voice? Can we have a consistent voice would be some of the answers at a higher level, Roxy, that I'd say. Uh, thanks, Tim. And um, look, uh, it's uh, I do speak to you regularly, um, but uh, I did want to get a bit of an articulation of sort of your thoughts and opinions. Um, uh, it's been a real pleasure today. I know that um, uh, you probably weren't the keenest to start with to come in, but um, no, I thought, well, I'll, I'll, t- I'll, tease out, I'll tease out some insights. And if anyone um, wants to learn more, um, there'll be about Tim or what it is that he does. There's, there's links there um, in, in, the, in the attachments, um, and they can look him up as well. But uh, Tim, on behalf of 
of XY um, and the XY podcast and everyone here and all the people listening. I'd like to thank you for your insights and um, wish you a very good day. Cheers, mate. Pleasure. Thank you, Rox. Thank you.